Um, before I invite Pastor Michelle for the last time this weekend, I, we've got a little photo, a little snippet of her, what she used to look like when she was <laughs> just a gorgeous little princess. Can we have that up on the screen, please, if you've got that? Oh, my gosh, how cute. And, of course, there she is right there with the hair. <laughs> the, the, the hair looks crooked, Michelle, there. It looks crooked. <laughs> That's the thing. Isn't she adorable? Michelle, we've loved having you. We, we've just been blessed. And we're so looking forward to you sharing with us tonight. So let's all stand. Give her a last... Homecoming Princess, welcome! Woohoo! I look, I look really angry in that. I, I am. Oh, I was a cutie. I still am, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. I still am because <laughs> I love myself now. <laughs> That's good. Well, you ready for that lion to come out tonight? All righty. So, over this weekend, we've been talking about the love of the Father and getting our security in our identity in Christ and that our worth and value and love can only be found in that one true source, Jesus Christ. But I believe when we have these things as our foundation, in life, that we are poised to step into all that God has for us. So th this morning, um, we talked about um, a hiding, hiding behind our personas and a hiding we make for ourselves. But tonight, I want to talk about a different type of hiding. And it's the hiding where we can shrink back in fear and intimidation and allow the enemy to keep us down instead of walking in the fullness that God has for us. The Bible clearly tells us that God has plans for our lives. He has created us for a purpose. He's given us giftings, talents, desires, experiences to prepare us for his plans. But often, I know in my life, I've allowed the enemy to come and to steal away the purposes of God in my life. And in Song of Solomon, I keep in Song of Solomon tonight, um, 2 verse 15, and it says, You must catch the troubling foxes, those sly little foxes, foxes that hinder our relationship, for they raid our budding vineyard of love to ruin what I've planted within you. Will you catch them and remove them for me? We will do it together. So good, isn't it? So the enemy tries to ruin what God has planted within us. When we are created in our mother's room, he plants within us a seed. And the enemy will try to take that seed to ruin um, our lives. John 10.10, 10, which to me is a kind of a testimony scripture. Because it says, the thief does not come, to st comes only to steal, to kill and to destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And I see that as like a two parts of my life. Like the first half of my life, I allowed the enemy to steal, kill and destroy. But praise God that God came through with his abundant life and I'm living in such, so much more fullness now than I ever used to. And the, and the enemy comes and he tries to stop us from growing and from receiving all that God has for us. He tries to steal that seed of potential in us before it can blossom, before it can come to full fruition. You know, we, we've seen in the story of the Shulamite woman this weekend that her bridegroom offered her much. And yet she originally wouldn't go with him because she was afraid. And I think sometimes we, we can be the same, that we shrink back from all that God has for us. And there are a couple of scriptures as well that I've noticed that show us that the Israelites also struggled with this at times. And the first one is found in Judges 6, verses 2 to 4. And it says, The Midianites were so cruel 
that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle and donkey. 1 Samuel 13 tells a story where we see the Philistines came. They were forming a great army against the Israelites. And it says in verse 6, it says, The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. And I find, when I read those scriptures, I find them very hard to believe because this was the mighty Israelites, the mighty Israelites, God's own people. These are the ones that took possession of the promised land. And the Bible tells us when they were entering the promised land that the other nations feared them because they had a mighty God on their side that was conquering uh, and taking possession of the land. And yet, and God had given them great victory over the enemies. But now, they were the ones hiding. They were the ones in fear. Instead of being this mighty army that they once were, they were not created for that because they were God's own people. And we are not created for that. You know, before the Israelites went into the promised land, God spoke to Joshua. And we see in Joshua 1, some things that God said to him before he went into the promised land. Verse 5 and 6 says, No man will be able to stand before you to oppose you as long as you live. Just as I was present with Moses, so I will be with you. And I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and confident and courageous. For you will give this people as an inheritance the land which I swore to your fathers. To give them. And then down in verse 9, he says, Have not I commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or dismayed or intimidated, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I want to remind you of that tonight, that that promise is for you as well. You know, whenever we are tempted to shrink back in fear, remember that we are commanded to be strong and courageous and not allow the enemy to intimidate us for we have God on our side and he is with us wherever we go and you know this is the mindset that uh, Joshua and the Israelites went into the promised land with that God was on their side and he would help them conquer the land in Psalm 78 we see an example of mighty warriors shrinking back in Psalm 78 verses 9 to 11 it says Take, for example, the sons of Ephraim, though they were equipped warriors, each with weapons. That's what Pastor Chris was talking about. These were warriors equipped with weapons. They were trained to be warriors. But when the battle came, it says they retreated and ran away in fear. They didn't really believe the promises of God and they refused to trust him and move forward in their faith. They forgot, they forgot his wonderful works and the miracle of the past. And you know, I believe that when we find ourselves shrinking back and allowing the enemy to steal from us is when we have forgotten who we are, when we have forgotten whose we are, and when we forget who is on our side and who is our God. And we allow circumstances and the lies of the enemy and the thinking of the world to infiltrate our hearts and our minds. And we find ourselves forgetting what God has said about us. And this is the reason why I'll say it every time I preach. It's so important to be in the word of God. It's important to stay in community, in relationship with God. So we will never forget who God is and who we are. And this was a key for Joshua as well. In Joshua 1.8, God said, Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night. 
so that you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. So tonight I believe that God is calling us out of our hiding places, our caves, and where the enemy has tried to make us retreat to. And the first thought I want to uh, look at tonight is that we need to be alert and identify. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And like that dream you had, he look, he's prowling around trying to see what doors we have left open to access our hearts. So we need to identify our position where we find ourselves at the moment. And sometimes I don't think we realise that we have shrunk back and hiding away in the cave. Last year I started getting these black floaty things in my eyes and apparently it happens when you get older. I don't know, but it was very, very off-putting. And like I had to go home from work. It just, they just appeared and I couldn't see my computer or anything. It was really a strange feeling. But after a while, they started to clear up. And I'm like, oh, great. So I was at the eye specialist. I said, oh, they're actually cleared up. But the eye specialist said, no, they're still there. He said, your brain has adjusted to seeing through them. And, you know, every now and then I just catch a little glimpse of these black floaty things because they are still there. And I thought that was interesting. And I can see that is the same with us sometimes, that we um, can have things in our lives that hinder us and cause us to shrink back. But after a while, we can just learn to adjust, don't we? We learn to adjust and we live with them. And we think, well, you know, this is the new normal. This is how I'm going to have to live for the rest of my life. And every now and then those little things rear up their ugly heads and you're like, oh, actually, yes, they're still there and I am still, they're still keeping me down. But this is not how we were created. We were created to live totally free and living in the fullness that God has for us. So this evening, I want you to think about what may be in your life that always seems to hold you back. Have you, and may you may have come to accept that this is just how my life will be. But I don't believe, as children of God, that we have to accept those things. So I want to say to you tonight, no, you do not belong in a cave. You were created to live in the wide open spaces, the, the greatness that God has for you, the promised land that he has for you. And you know, there's so many things that can rob us, that can rob us of that abundant life and try to cause us to shrink back. I'm just going to name a few and it would be different for everyone. But some things that can cause us to shrink back is discouragement, our past, rejection, insecurities, shame, fear, hurt or unforgiveness, age, both young and old, negative words spoken over us, mistakes or regrets, or sometimes long battles. They can weary us and we just think, I just want to sit down and go and hide away. And, and then labels that people put on us. People can label us with certain things. That person is that, that, that. And I remember a dream when I was preparing this sermon. I remember a dream I had years ago. And the en it was a big group of people and the enemy was walking around amongst the people and he was sticking labels on them like this, putting labels on them. And, you know, putting lab labels of fear, putting labels of stupid, ugly, shy, victim, all these labels that he puts on people. But then I believe tonight, as I was thinking about that dream, I believe tonight the Holy Spirit is going to walk around and he's going to rip those labels off and he's going to replace them with beautiful, strong, courageous, victorious, worthy, beautiful. So I believe that's going to happen tonight. If we, if we let that happen, God's going to do it. So we have, all have things that try to come against us, an area where the enemy tries to steal, kill and destroy. The enemy is constantly trying to keep us hidden. 
and will come to steal our destiny, our confidence, our identity, to keep us from standing our ground and claiming all that God has for us. I can remember years ago when I first started pastoring, we, I went on an overseas trip to a developing nation. There was just three of us ladies that went, and I was sort of leading the group. And anyway, they had, I had another pastor with me, and then there was this young girl who'd never been on an overseas trip before. And she was struggling. If you've never been to a developing nation, it, you can struggle a bit with the poverty and things like that. So she was really struggling. She'd never seen that before, the extreme poverty that we went to visit. And anyway, on the way home, we stopped for just a couple of days of R&R sort of thing at the end. And the last day, she walks into my hotel room. She gets in my face and she screams at me, pastors have fallen off my pedestal. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm like, what the heck is that all about? I'm like, for one thing, I shouldn't be on your pedestal. But other than that... What on earth did I do? Like, I was just mortified. I was devastated because I try to live with integrity and I, you know, do the right thing. And I'm trying to think, what on earth did I do to make her react to me like this? And But, you know, I didn't realise how much those words had affected me. And it wasn't until like, we got back and we resolved all the stuff and it was just internal stuff that she was going through. So everything was sort of good. But I didn't realise how much those words had affected me. And I didn't realise it was about two years later that the Lord showed me that these words had caused me to shrink back and had robbed my confidence and my authority in my calling. And, you know, so I just want to ask, you know, is there any... People hear that words have been spoken over you that have eroded your identity, that have eroded your confidence or your authority. You know, if we continually listen to lies, we will be robbed of that confidence and authority. So I pray tonight that, you know, if there's something in your life that is holding you back, that the Holy Spirit would reveal that to you. And, um, yeah, I just believe tonight that the the Lord just wants to call you out from those things, out from under the influence of those things. And I want to encourage you with the next thought, too, that we are not ones who shrink back. We are not ones who shrink back. And Hebrews 10, it's it's, um, encouraging the church. They're uh, going through persecution, And it's encouraging the believers to persevere in their faith through their persecution. But I think this scripture can encourage us today, even though we are nothing like what they went through. But I think it can encourage us with this thought of things causing us to shrink back. And Hebrews 10, 38, 39 says, But my righteous ones shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. And I want to speak this out over you tonight and declare it to the enemy and encourage you in this, that you are not one who shrinks back. And I want us to say that about ourselves, that we are not ones who shrink back. Let's all say that together. We are not ones who shrink back. Amen. We make that confession over our lives. We are the ones who continue to rise up when things try to keep us down. And I want to read these scriptures tonight um, from Proverbs. Actually, are they up on the screen? Proverbs, can you all see the next one? I want you to read them with me tonight. It's Proverbs 24, 16. For a just man shall fall seven times and shall rise again. Same scripture in a different version. We've got the next one, yeah. So good people might fall again and again, but they will always get up. Micah 7, 8, the next one. I like this one. Do not gloat over me, my enemies, For though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, 
the Lord shall be my light. And I want to say that to the enemy tonight. Do not gloat over me because I will rise again like a phoenix. (laughs) So there's nothing wrong with falling and failing. But we are not called to stay down. We are called to rise up again as daughters of the king. And even though the enemy will try to keep us down, God is on our side and we are more than conquerors. In 2 Samuel 23, we see a list of David's mighty men. I think there was 30 from memory. And one of them is called Shammah. I like this guy, Shammah. In 2 Samuel 23, 11, 12, it says of him, And next to him was Shammah, the son of Agi the Hararite. The Philistines gathered together at Lehi, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, And the Israelites fled from the Philistines. But Shammah took his stand in the midst of the plot and defended it and struck down the Philistines. And the Lord worked a great victory. I love this guy. Shammah, he was sick of allowing the Philistines to take their ground. And he got to the place where he was like, I've had enough of this. I'm going to stand up to these guys and I'm going to beat those guys. And, you know, I think that we need to have that same mentality where we say, I am sick of the enemy running me down all the time, causing me to hide away. It's time for me to rise. And enemy is not going to gloat over me anymore. You've pushed me around long enough. I can remember when I turned 60, I was sort of started to feel a bit sorry for myself, you know, as you do when you turn those big zero numbers. And, you know, we were in the process of starting to hand over the church and um, to the next generation. And we knew that it was the right thing to do for us. But the devil was in my ear. He's going, getting a bit old, getting a bit old. And it's like, you're kind of near the use by date. It's just about to expire. You're getting on now. It's time to kind of like hang up your hat and sit back and shrink back and just let life pass you by. So I started to you know, get a bit bit down about this. And I started to retreat and hide sort of a little bit while others sort of started to rise up. But you know what? If we're still breathing, God still has something for us to do. I don't care how old you are, there is always something for you to do. But God spoke to me from Hebrews 11, 11, And I love this. And it says, by faith, even Sarah herself conceived the ability, sorry, received the ability to conceive a child even when she was long past the normal age for it, because she considered him who had given her the promise to be reliable and true to his word. Now, I don't want to have a baby, but I believe, (laughs) but I believe even though I was getting older, I could conceive new things and I can birth new things. So this scripture just gave me just a fresh, a fresh um, lease on life, really, because I was getting a bit, Sorry for myself, but God hasn't finished with me yet. And I don't care how old you are, God hasn't finished with you. You're still on this planet and you're still breathing. So that word spoke truth into the areas where the enemy and the culture even was trying to speak lies and say, this is how your life's going to be from now on. You know, a few years ago, there was a season in my life when um, I was in a season of struggle, feeling a bit lost. It seems like I'm always struggling. I don't know. I've got lots of sermon illustrations. I'm just like, I'm the queen of the desert, I think. But anyway, so there were, (laughs) queen of the wilderness. That's that's not a good movie, is it? No, (laughs) queen of the wilderness. Um, So there were a couple of things dominating my thinking. And one of them was, (laughs) sorry, that wasn't me. I kept rehashing the past. I kept going over decisions that, you know, we had made and I was, living in regret because maybe, you know, we should have done things differently. So I kept going through this all the time. And I was also realised that I was grieving like the old me. And what I mean by that was I was looking back to a previous season thinking, oh, I was so much more fruitful back then and oh, look at me now, you know. And I kept looking to the past all the time. But that thinking was preventing me from living in the present, 
It was robbing me of what God wanted to do in my life in the current season. It was causing me to shrink back into a cave of regret and self-pity. But God in his grace kept saying to me through just everywhere I went, it was like, forget the past, forget the past. I'm like, okay, God, I get the message, I get the message. And so Isaiah 43 in the message version says, forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. I mean, you can't be any more obvious than that. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? I love that. And when I read that, it's like, you know what? I have got to stop focusing on the past because it has robbed me of my vision for the present and for the future and for the new thing that God wanted to do in my life now. And I made a decision to draw a line in the sand and just say what past is past and everything behind that line is old and I'm going to step into the new. And... um, I love this story in Numbers 27. And it's a story of five sisters, the daughters of Zelophehad, or Zelophehad or something. And anyway, so back in the days, this is back in the days of Moses when he was allocating the land to all the families. And in those days, there was a law that if a father died and left no sons, that the land would go to the nearest male relative and the daughters would be without any inheritance. And so as Moses was allocating the land to the, uh, to the different clans, these five sisters, they rose up and they said, they went and saw Moses and they said, that is not fair. Why should we miss out on our inheritance because our father died without any sons? So Moses went to the Lord and he asked the Lord about it and the Lord said, that's right. He said, those, you need to give that land to those daughters. But you know, what I love about this is that these, they, they didn't just get their land, but Moses actually changed the law so that every other daughter within the same situation would get their land. And you know, these five sisters changed history because they chose to speak up, to break free from what culture said they couldn't do. And I love this because these daughters didn't sit back and let this rightful inheritance be taken from them. They stood up, they went after it, and they received it. But not only did they receive it for themselves, but their actions changed the law so that other daughters could also receive their inheritance. This is just so powerful, I think. Our standing up and living in the fullness of all God that has, has for us will not only change our lives, but can affect those around us and the generations to come. You know, when as parents we stand up and we walk in the fullness that God has for us, it allows our children to then follow through in that same and receive everything that God has for them. And, you know, we need to identify what's causing us to shrink back and we need to rise back up and come out of our caves and take back that inheritance that is rightfully ours. The world is waiting for you to come out of hiding, to live in freedom and bring who God created you to be to this world. He has a plan and a purpose for you that does not involve hiding away. And maybe you're coming out of your cave and telling your story and sharing the truths that God has shown you can help other women experience their freedom too. And that's the power of a testimony. And I loved hearing those testimonies today. And thank you so much, ladies, for being brave enough to share your testimonies. Because I love testimonies because one thing, it's like, oh, someone else is, understands what I'm going through. And then also it just brings hope because you're like, God did it for them. God can do it for me. I just love testimonies. So don't shrink back, ladies, because you don't know what effect you, your standing up can have in this world and other people's lives. So the last thought I want to bring tonight to is that our freedom is a partnership. And one I think is, uh, thing I think is important is to realise that we don't have to come out of our cave by ourselves. Jesus is waiting there with his hand extended and we just have to reach up and he will help pull us out and walk alongside of us. Song of Solomon 2.15, when it talks about those little 
troubling foxes. It says, will you catch them and remove them for me? We will do it together. And, you know, I've been recently reading the book of Joshua. And I've really enjoyed and getting a lot out of the book uh, when I read it. It's a story, you know, the story how he possessed the promised land. But there's a strategy he had in fighting every battle that I noticed when I was reading it this time. And there were three key elements to every battle that they succeeded in. And the ones they didn't use this strategy, they lost. But the first thing is that God spoke to Joshua and gave him a strategy. So Joshua had a relationship with God. They were on speaking terms. He was listening to what God had to say to him. The second thing was, once he heard that strategy, God, uh, Joshua obeyed and did exactly what the Lord said. And, but the third thing is, I noticed, it says that God gave the victory. You know, God spoke to Joshua, do this. Joshua obeyed, even though with the natural mind, it did not seem logical. Like, walk around a wall seven times, like, that's crazy in our natural mind. But he obeyed. He obeyed what God said. But then God manifest his power. And constantly through Joshua, we read things like, Joshua inflicted a crushing defeat on them for Yahweh threw them into a panic. And Yahweh empowered Joshua. Yahweh gave them the victory. Yahweh himself fought for Israel. Yahweh fought along them to defeat the enemy. By the power of Yahweh, Joshua defeated them all. I love these statements because it shows that even though we can face mighty armies as we try to take possession of our promised land, we don't have to do it alone. It's a divine partnership. It's not all God. We also have to do our part. But not a striving, but a working together in the divine partnership with God. Joshua 24, 18 says, And as they advanced, Yahweh powerfully drove out the enemies. There was a dual thing there. They had to go forward, but Yahweh gave the victory. It was a divine partnership. And when we move as God commands, it will release his power for victory. And, you know, I believe this is, that this is the power of obeying the word of God. When we live according to the principles in the word of God, in the scripture, God's power is released to act on our behalf. I believe that. It's a powerful principle. And I've noticed over the years that the very thing that the enemy tries to rob from us can be the very thing that God's plan is attached to. You know, one of the major things that have tried to keep me hiding in a cave is fear. Fear just permeated so many areas of my life. And there's too many to talk about. I could give you story after story, but fear held me back from living out my calling for many years. I can remember when we first started pastoring and Mark would ask me to do something that involved speaking in public or meeting new people. And I would just say, no, get someone else to do it. And I constantly just saying, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm too shy. I was terrified of people. I was so shy. I would never get up in front of anyone and speak, which is crazy considering what God calls us to do sometimes. But, you know, I could tell you story after story, but, but obviously time doesn't pit. But one, one night, God gave me a dream that changed my life. And I'll, the dream was about a snake. We're like, yeah, yeah. do 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 do. <laughs> it was this snake, and we were sitting in this audience. Um, sitting in this audience, there was a snake charmer out the out the front with his snakes doing his thing, and I'm sitting in the seat, and I and I'm in my seat thinking, that snake is going to escape, and he's going to come straight to me. And I, I knew he was going to happen, and fair, sure enough, the snake escaped from the basket thing, and he slithered through the crowd and came straight to me and as he was coming to me I just sat in my seat in absolute terror I had my eyes shut and just cringing in fear and I could this snake was right up in my face like this and I just cringed in fear I could not open my eyes and there was a person sit, sitting next to me and I know it was the Holy Spirit and he was saying for that snake to go away, you have to open your eyes and you have to stare him in the eyes. 
And I said, I can't, I can't, I'm too fearful. And the Holy Spirit kept saying, stare him in the eyes, that's the only way he's going to go. And so after much fear and trepidation, I opened my eyes and I stared that darn snake right in the eyes and it shriveled back and slithered away. And, you know, when I woke up that next morning, I knew that was a God dream. And I woke up and I made a vow to God that I would never say no because of fear again. You know, it's okay to say no, but not because of fear. So the next time Mark asked me to speak or go and see someone or do something I was afraid of, I just had to start saying yes. And, you know, as Joyce Meyer says, do it afraid. But for for that fear to go in my life, I had to stare it in the eyes for it to go. But this dream pointed out to me the power of me cooperating in my freedom God doesn't, sometimes he does just do things like that, and I've had things like that happen, but he doesn't often just drop it in our laps, we, and we are miraculously changed. I can remember in this church and the years after I left this church, going out to many older calls. I'm like, God, deliver me from fear. God, I don't want to be shy. Make me bold. Make me courageous. I, and I just, honestly, I went out to so many altar calls for God to do that, expecting him to just drop it from the sky and I'm just this new person. But it never happened. It never happened. It wasn't until I started to cooperate with God, that's when the fear started to break. But after this dream, I realised that like Joshua, I needed to play a part in my victory. I had to do the things that I was afraid of to get free from it. Um, I think the musos can come up actually probably a while back, but we'll, yeah, nearly finished. It's all good. You are pretty quick around here. So, <laughs> um, so in my experience, it's a process of day by day walking out our freedom. You know, the Bible says that when they took the land, they took the land little by little. And, you know, often we are standing here and we want to, we, our destination is over there and we think we just want to get there in one big bound. But I've found it's like, no, little, conquer this thing, yeah, victory, okay, now this one, now this one. Like them possessing the land, they just fought one giant after the next, one nation after the next, and they finally got to their destination. So it's a process. And so I went on that journey of slowly being set free in the area of speaking up and speaking out. Like, as an introvert, being married to a charismatic, outgoing person, it's just like, uh, introvert shy person's dream because I could just like hide behind him and he go and talk to people and I'd be just like oh I talked to a lot of people tonight but I was actually just in a group with my husband I didn't really talk to them but God said to me one night he said it was actually someone prophesied over me and I was actually sort of standing a bit behind my husband on the stage and he said it's time for you to step out of the shadows and step up beside your husband and that was part of my process I had to do to step out from behind his shadow and become the person that God wanted me to be. And I believe that's why God said to Joshua before he went into the promised land, you have to be brave, you have to be courageous because he was going to have to do some things that required that. So if you don't know how to step out of your cave, just take one step at a time. That's all you have to do. First step, acknowledge, first of all, that you are in a cave and identify what it is that's holding you back. You have to know your enemy. Make a decision. I will not shrink back anymore. I am going to step out of this cave and face this obstacle. I will not allow the enemy to keep me down any longer. And it is a decision. It's a decision we have to make. Get connected to God and hear what He's saying to you and listen and obey. When you do that, I believe you will see God's power released and He's going to do more than you thought possible. And you'll find yourself emerging from the cave into the wide open spaces that God has for you. And I believe tonight He wants to come to those places where we hide and He's offering His hand to you. Come, we will do it together. We will do it together. And I believe that this word is for some people tonight. God wants to take you into bigger spaces and wider places. He's saying it's time. 
it's time. It's time to stop letting these things hold you back and confine you. I would love us all just to stand tonight. And I'm going to finish by reading a part of the Song of Solomon. And I want to speak this prophetically over you. And I believe that it's, it's a word that even as I'm speaking it, that I believe that God's going to activate something in you tonight. So just shut your eyes. And if you want to put your hands out, just receive what the Lord wants to say to you. And hear it as the Lord's speaking to you tonight. The one I love calls to me. Arise, my dearest. Hurry, my darling, and come away with me. I have come, as you have asked, to draw you to my heart and to lead you out. He wants to lead you out of your cave tonight. For now is the time, my beautiful one. The season has changed. The bondage of your barren winter has ended. The season of hiding is over and gone. The rains have soaked the earth and left it with bright, blossoming flowers. The season for singing and pruning the vines has arrived. I hear the cooing of doves in our land, filling the air with songs to awaken you and guide you forth. Can you not discern this new day of destiny breaking forth around you? The early signs of my purposes and plans are bursting forth. The budding vines of new life are now blooming everywhere. The fragrance of their flowers whispers, there is change in the air. Arise, my love, my beautiful companion, and run with me to a higher place for now is the time to arise and to come away with me.